eShop. You know it, you love it. There's over 10,000 games slammed onto the Nintendo Switch. So you know, it's kind of hard to find the good ones. Well, actually it's easy if you watch my videos where I find the good ones and then tell you about them like I'm doing today. I found 10 more great games. There's something for everyone. This is gonna be a really fun video. It's also episode 29, which means this will be 290 eShop games I have reviewed in this series alone on my channel. Insane. Next episode will obviously be episode 30 and 300 games, so I'm gonna have to do something special. It gives me chills just thinking about it. If you've been watching this series or just joining me on this Switch journey from the start, thank you. If you find a game you like today or you just enjoy the video, please like, leave a comment down below, and subscribe. Okay, let's do it again. Let's Kick off the list blistering hot with Anno Mutatium. Anno, 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 Mutate, 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 AM. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's probably my favorite one in the video. <laughs> this game completely blew me away with the quality of its visual presentation and detailed world building. It's an action adventure game with RPG elements set in a rich, dark, and bizarre cyberpunk world based on the concept of 2D meets 3D. But it's a much more fleshed out art style than the recent Square Enix games. I was hooked right from the start when you're thrown into these completely animated cutscenes and then straight into the vibrant and gritty city that this game takes place in. I can't help but see the obvious comparisons to this game and Cyberpunk 2077, except I actually like this game. Your apartment looks very similar. Even the entire apartment complex. There's cops investigating a crime scene at your neighbor's door. Even the same menu and skill trees look very similar. The setting feels the same vibe-wise, but there are some obvious huge differences here. The combat, for example, takes place on a 2D plane, and it's a hack-and-slash beat-em-up style. It feels great to play, switching between swords, guns, combos, and grenades. The story is paced really well, with both main story and side missions, featuring a lot of investigating and exploration. They managed to cram a decent amount into this concise 10 to 12 hour adventure. But as much as I enjoyed the story, I was constantly floored by the design of the game and the details, both little and huge. I mean, just look at even the title screen for the game. So cool. How do you not want to play that? Just, I've, I've got to go play it right now. Wah, yeah, gotcha. You thought you were watching a YouTube video, but I'm here to hack your internet. Actually, no, I'm not. It's my day off. I, I don't hack in October. So you got lucky this time. But to prevent it happening next time, you should probably click the link in the description and get ExpressVPN by going to expressvpn.com forward slash beat-em-ups. Let me tell you why. That's good. Henry nailed it again. That's why I love coming to Barbados. Look, using the internet without a VPN is like mailing a postcard, right? Anybody can look at that postcard and take a sneaky peek on what you wrote to your dearest little old daddy. <laughs> because whether you're connected to an unencrypted internet network on your phone, computer, tablet, TV, etc., you're sending out countless pieces of information that someone on the same unencrypted network can then see and steal, like your emails, passwords, logins, financial details, you name it. But a VPN, like ExpressVPN, creates a secure tunnel between your device and the internet. In other words, it's like putting that little postcard to your daddy in an envelope. Now when you mail it, if anyone picks it up, they can't see what's inside. ExpressVPN can both mask and encrypt your internet data. I'm getting paid on my day off, right? Not to mention, there is a little fun side effect of having ExpressVPN. Like, you know how many websites are blocked in different countries or like YouTube videos sometimes are blocked and you can't watch them if you're in this place or that place or even shows like Rick and Morty and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. You can't access that on the US Netflix. No matter where you are in the world, using ExpressVPN will allow you to access content all around the world. Because ExpressVPN lets you change your online location. They have like nine four different countries you can choose to appear from. So if you want the VPN with the fastest speeds, well, you're gonna need to get ExpressVPN. And I got good news for you. You can get three months for free right now. If you click the link down below or go to expressvpn.com forward slash beat-em-ups. Look, I didn't hack you this time, but next time, if you don't do that, I'm gonna get you. Henry, 
Did you put sugar in this? You know, you know I don't drink sugar anymore. I can't believe that in my channel's lifetime, I started my channel nine years ago. It's almost 10 years old. I get to review a new Monkey Island game. I don't think you understand what this means to me. Monkey Island was the original game series that got me into gaming, that got me into point and clicks. It's why in all of these eShop videos I make, I try and sneak a point and click onto the list because I just love them so much because of this series. But this, this is the real swashbuckling deal. The one of a kind original point and click Monkey Island. Island. Return to Monkey Island came out of nowhere, and it's a fantastic return to the series by the same creator Ron Gilbert and featuring the original cast of voice actors. This Monkey Island is a return to its original point and click form, with traditional challenging puzzles and even a hard mode if you want to kick up the brain teasers another notch. I'll admit that initially I wasn't sold on the art style, but it really grew on me quickly while playing. It has a 90s and 2000s cartoon vibe and I love the way the camera throws to the characters' faces or actions during the story beats to highlight the ridiculous, gross, and hilarious moments. Also, I wasn't expecting this game to wrap up the story of Monkey Island so nicely in a neat little bow. This game acts like a sequel to Secret of Monkey Island and Monkey Island 2, essentially turning these games into a trilogy. I just hope that it doesn't spell the end of Monkey Island because I definitely want more of this, please. I don't want to ruin too much of the game. Game, just go play it for yourself. Okay, so on my podcast, the Nintendo podcast, links below, listen today, we reviewed a bunch of indie devs and publishers and game creators about their games coming soon. And one of the people we interviewed was Celia from Yacht Club Games talking about their upcoming game, Shovel Knight Dig. And guess what? It released. And I love it. And I'm not biased. It's actually really good. <laughs> I mean, it's Shovel Knight, of course it is. So this game is the Shovel Knight you know and you love. But if... Shovel Knight was a roguelike, and also if you dug down rather than scrolled left to right. Funny enough though, the game is still listed as side-scrolling, and I think we should really make an exception here and create a new genre. You know, like, down-scrolling, maybe? Because it's not side-to-side. -side. It doesn't make any sense. When we asked Celia about how many areas and challenge screens may have been created for this game, she suggested it was likely in the thousands. And every time you play, so you never know what you're gonna find as you dig and spelunk your way deeper and deeper. Loads of hidden areas and secrets, enemies and hazards around every corner and a fun Mega Man-esque boss battles at the end of each area. And as you would expect, in between each run you can upgrade yourself with new relics and accessories to make future digs that much easier. Which is good, because I do find this game pretty hard at times. And don't worry, it's not one of those roguelites that will consume your life. This one's quite a bit shorter than others I have played in the genre, but it's just fun, you know? That's why I'm talking about it. Mini Motorways is both one of the most calming and stressful games I've ever played. This one actually wasn't even planned to be on the list, but as I was scripting this video, my YouTube manager messaged me and said, hey, I'm playing this game called Mini Motorways. Have you heard of it? It's a ton of fun. So I downloaded it, and sure enough, it was a ton of fun, and I ended up playing it a lot so here it is. It's really freaking simple. You pick a part of the world you want to play in, then little car garages and big buildings start randomly popping up. You build the road to connect them, and the cars will automatically start traveling to and from the buildings that matches its color. I know, but it's fun. Let me get hot. But as more and more colors pop in, the more cars you will have on the roads you are creating. So it's a delicate balance between making sure all the cars are able to get to where they need to go without creating massive traffic jams and build-ups that will end up resulting in game over if not enough cars can get to the buildings in time. I swear it's fun. I, I don't know if it doesn't look or sound fun, it just is. The better you do, the more roads, highways, bridges, tunnels, roundabouts, traffic lights, and more you'll get access to to help ease up some of the congestion on the streets. It's addictive, just trying to get the biggest working city possible, aiming for high scores and keeping a run moving for as long as possible. The sounds of the game are so soothing, from the cars shuffling down the road to the placement of objects around the world. I know how it looks. It's just so cozy and fun. Give it a shot. So Temtem is like Pokemon. No, like li like literally, it, it is. It, this is Pokemon. Okay, glad we got that sorted. Next game. Oh, you, you want more? All right. So Temtem is a massively multiplayer creature collection adventure. At least... They say it is. It's an MMO by definition, but not an MMO in the sense of an MMO that you might be familiar with. 
MMO. A la games like Final Fantasy Online or World of Warcraft. No, in Temtem, you can see other players running around and going about their day questing, battling, and collecting, sure, but they are sort of like Dark Souls ghosts into the game. You can interact with them though, you can send friend requests, battle, or trade requests, and you can even bring them into your game as Temtem does support two-player co-op, which is actually how I played the game with my buddy Scoot. We streamed us playing the game together. It was so much fun. The functionality of the co-op is pretty glitchy, but it is stable and honestly pretty sick. You can progress through the campaign together, even doing the side quest. When one of you starts a battle, the other will join to help out. If you find a wild Temtem, both trainers get the chance to catch it. It's really cool, and I wish Pokemon would introduce something like this. They might. They do have multiplayer in the new Pokemon. It's just, as I stand here, we have no idea how that works yet. It would make a lot of sense since they always do release the games and a lot of people play releases alongside their siblings or partners. The game itself, whether you play with friends or alone, is exactly like you would expect from a traditional 2D Pokemon game. Wake up in your mum's house, go pick your first Temtem from three starters, battle your rivals, set out on a journey, going town to town, completing puzzles, collecting creatures, and defeating gyms or dojos in this case, to progress the story of the game. It has all the flair that you love from Pokemon games too, even including the rare chance to find a shiny Temtem and evolving your favorites. So you might be wondering, why would I play Temtem if it is just Pokemon. Well, because they actually made Temtem to be the Pokemon games they wish they had. It's tough. Like, actually pretty hard. Slogs through dungeons or gym battles will take a lot of going back and healing up your Temtems or actually having to use items effectively. All the battles are duo battles, leading to a lot more strategy in how you play, even including moves that boost each other's partner Temtems abilities or even hurts them if you have the wrong pairing. There is some controversy around Temtem though, as it was in an alpha beta state for a very long time, and when it released, it released full price, but they snuck a little battle pass in there too that you can pay for. And people weren't very happy about that, understandably. But if you ignore all that and you just want to play a fun game, Temtem at its core is a good time. Y you, you all like farming sims, right? I mean, uh, half my comments seem to yell and scream at me anytime I dare bring up that last direct being even a little bit mid because we want all the farming games we can, Would Bring them all on. That direct was for us. Well, then I hope to dear God, you're playing Ooblets because it hasn't finished loading yet. Kind of ruined my rant. It's just a dancing fish right now. But I hope to God you're playing There's a Hidden Gem. It's a farming sim meets Pokemon, and it's fantastic. So if you haven't played this yet, and you're crying that there's not enough farming sims or that you want more, shut up and go back and play this one. It's actually so much more than a farming sim, though. It's really cool. There is seriously so much to do in Ooblets. It's overwhelming. And I probably can't cram it all into this short review. You start the game by moving to this new, colorful, and quirky town, populated by interesting characters and just so many ooblets. There are currently 45 different kinds, but they all have color variants, and on top of that, the chance to find gleamies, which look so much better than the regular shiny variants in Pokemon games. They can be all kinds of multicolor rainbows, and even have a gleaming trail as they follow you around. Before you even start setting out on your collecting adventure, though, you're given the keys to an old rundown farm. You repair your new house and begin planting, watering, and harvesting crops as you live on a day-to-day -day cycle. In the town nearby, you can find a crop store, a coffee shop, barber, science lab, dance battle hall, and so much more. Later in the game, you can even open your own shop in town to sell whatever you want. And that's a whole other aspect to the game. Around all of that, you can grow relationships with the townsfolk, complete side missions and objectives, work on repairing and upgrading the town, travel to whole other areas and do missions and collect new oblets there. There's even an arcade town where you can play all different arcade games that were made exclusively for this game. I mean it. There's so much to do. Then, with the ooblets you find, you can offer them different foods for the opportunity to dance battle them. These battles get pretty strategic as the game progresses. You use cards to gain points or steal points from the opponent. There are all different status effects to deal with, and every ooblet comes with their own special cards and ways of dance battling, and you get even more cards when you level them up. If you win the battle, the other ooblet will fart out a seed, and you can take that fart seed back to your farm and plant it and grow your very own new farty friend. 
These friends can either join your party and follow you around or live on the farm and help take care of the day to day. And did I mention you can dress them up in all kinds of hats, accessories, and little cute outfits? Just so freaking adorable. I got Kim addicted to this game too, and it's just so worth its price tag and then some. And again, I can't stress how much there is to do in the game. It's so good and definitely worth its price tag. Okay, so this list of 10 games has been a little wordy. I had a lot to say about the games I've talked about and say it, I did. So I'm gonna keep the next two short because I actually have already reviewed them. It was back in August, I talked about a bunch of games that I have played before and those games were Hold of the Lamb and Curse to Golf. I love both of these a lot and I always intended on re-reviewing them and putting them into one of my eShop videos because these eShop videos for me are kind of like canon lore to the eShop games that I really truly love. This might be weird, but a personal like seal of approval for an eShop game to wind up in one of these videos. So to not put these games in would feel like an injustice. So I went and watched my reviews to see what I can add to those now. And I think I did pretty good actually. I think if you go back and watch that video, I'll link it down below. I'd really just be repeating myself. So they are on this list, but I've already reviewed them. But just in case you are really lazy, let me give you a quick rundown on them both. Call to the Land was a Smash cult hit. For an indie game to release and drop 1 million in units sold is almost unheard of. It's a roguelike action adventure where you play as a cute possessed lamb running a cult by day and dungeon crusading by night. You manage your cult by gathering resources, building structures, worshipping with followers, performing rituals, and sacrificing the ones who trusted you most to the gods above. I guess the demons below. It's crazy fun and it's already won several awards for excellence in music, art, gameplay, and I agree with all of that 100%. And and then Curse to Golf is a golf game like you have never played, while some of the concepts might still be pretty familiar. You are strike dead during a golf tournament and sent to golf purgatory. Here, you have to complete an 18-hole golf course in order to be resurrected, but you only get so many strokes on a hole, and if you die, you have to go all the way back to the start. The next time you try to escape, everything will be different, as there's over 70 pre-designed levels that randomly show up. And on top of that, you gotta deal with cursed holes, boss battles, and specific obstacles depending on on the biome you're playing in. In your favor though, you have three different clubs to use and a whole deck of special cards that grant you single use abilities. It is a tough game. Like it is really hard. People have called it the dark souls of golf games. So be prepared to sink a ton of time into this one. Also, I did talk to the creator of this game, Liam, on my podcast, just like I did Celia. Actually, it was the same episode. So kind of cool that they ended up, both their games are in the same video here. I have a little, a little family that we all are. All right, moving on. Hi, I'm an idiot. Uh, I'm in a different place now because I forgot to introduce what was happening next. So I'm filming this later. Shh. I used to back in the day have other YouTubers, friends and guests come into these episodes and take one of the games to review for me. I haven't done it in a while and I figured this video needed just a little bit more sex appeal. And my buddy Bob is very hairy and very handsome. He also happens to be my fellow podcast co-host and he loves Tunic. It's ironic actually, I'm getting Bob to review the Zelda-like game, but he loves the game. And uh, it's on Switch now. So here is Bobby with his thoughts on Tunic for Nintendo Switch. Oh yeah, hey guys, it's me, it's the raw sex appeal. My favorite part about Tunic is that it works across a lot of different platforms. I got it on Steam, because I wanted to try it on the Steam Deck. And I didn't even want to buy it on Steam, because it was out on Game Pass at the time. But I was coaxed into it, and I'm very happy I did, because I can play it across my Steam Deck, across my PC, and even on my Mac. And it works beautifully on all those. Unfortunately, it looks a little mushy on the Switch, and I'm not sure why? Is it really that graphically intensive? Does this game really need all those lighting effects? Anyway, yeah, Tunic is like an homage to older top-down Zelda games, except this time it's a little isometric and you're a little fox guy. And I'd say there's more of a focus on combat here, dodge rolling across boss battles and locking onto enemies and such. Listen, I don't want to compare it to Dark Souls, but I'm going to compare it to Dark Souls. It can get pretty hard, so I would say this is more of an adult Zelda-like. You can get the general vibe by looking at it. It's a beautiful game. It's definitely worth checking out. $30 is kind of a lot for something like this, but I'd say it's worth it if you're gonna get the whole experience. The Switch version, it's a little harder to recommend because it, it just doesn't look as good. But if that's all you can get it on, I'd say it's still worth checking out even if it is a little bit mushy. Just play it in portable mode. It'll be 720p. Can I go now? 
Tinykin might have the word tiny in its name, but it offers big amounts of fun and charm. The game is Pikmin meets Paper Mario, as you catch hundreds of these cute Tinykin and use their unique abilities to bring Milo back to his home planet. You play as an outer world traveler who accidentally became trapped in a version of Earth that itself is trapped in the year 1991. And you're also trapped being shrunk down to ant size, using the Tinykin you find to gather gigantic items and using them to hopefully return home. Each Tinykin gets this adorable animated cutscene when you first meet them, which helps explain each of their abilities, like lifting heavy things, exploding, forming ladders, making bridges, even harnessing the power of electricity. You use these abilities both as you would expect, but also in very unexpected ways, often helping other characters around the world completing their weird requests or goals, like starting a bubble bath party. The art style is so charming, and it's truly a joy exploring the world and all of the environments they've built from the huge open areas to the nooks and crannies filled with little secrets and collectibles. The art design is fantastic. It's just a regular old house, but they've managed to make every area feel new, different, and exciting to traverse. There is so much fun packed in here. Even just skating around the world on a bar of soap is an enjoyable mechanic all on its own, and there's a lot of freedom here to explore at your own pace and tackle puzzles in any order you want to. It never feels too overwhelming, rather just a joy to see what you're gonna discover next. Next. This game is so clearly inspired by Pikmin, but just adding in platforming and all of the charm of an early 2000s cartoon. I found this one by accident at the last second as I was writing the video, and I can't believe I'd never heard or seen of the game before. Seen of the game? I'd never seen or heard of the game before. Oh, it's been a long video. I'm glad it's over. <laughs> Speaking of, that's another 10 games worth buying. 209. What should I do for episode 30? Should I just make the video, I guess? I don't know. Is there anything special I could do for it? Let me know down below. I hope you found something today that you're looking forward to playing. Again, there was a little something for everyone. I hope you guys are doing good and enjoying the fall. We're getting close to Christmas and all the holiday videos start being made. Actually, we gotta get through Halloween first. Anyone notice my cool, creepy Halloween shirt? Wore it on purpose. If you do want to help me out in any way, hit the bell, Twitch, podcast, and just, yeah, my video's here. Bye. Oh, and check out the sponsor. That's very important, too.